they were just robbed. The children of Israel were just had faced a terrible tragedy in their lives. Probably almost everything was taken away from them. But David gives him what he has. He lets him have the bread and the uh, water and the cake of figs and raisins. He gives him what they got. You know, and he didn't he didn't use that Egyptian. He didn't say, well, that's an Egyptian. He's not one of us. We, we don't want to help him. You know, that's, that's not the attitude that David had. You know, in the Good Samaritan parable in Luke 10, Jesus would say that a, a priest passed by this man that was beaten down, a Levite passed by this man that was beaten down, and then a Good Samaritan comes along. You know, these priests and Levites were supposed to be the people that knew the law of God. They knew that you should love your neighbor as yourself, and they didn't do these things. But a Good Samaritan That's what they do here. David gives this Egyptian help. And it actually turns out that this Egyptian. God is a faithful God, and he, is, he does promise victory. You know, today we're promised victory in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, it would say, But thanks be to God, which give us us the victory through Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. David knew that this wouldn't be in vain. He knew that God promised him that they would recover everything and along with his lives, and he trusted in God, and he put his faith in God here, and they fought. And you know, in, in verse 15, or actually verse 16, it would say, And when they brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. The enemy was unprepared. They were disorganized. They were scattered about playing, drinking. You know, that's not, that's not a way to fight wars. These guys weren't prepared. And there are dangers to being unprepared. You would read in Exodus 32 that in verse 6, they rose up early on the morrow. And this is the children of Israel. This isn't the enemies of God. This were, these were supposed to be God's people. And it said they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And then in verse 25 of Exodus 32, And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked under the shame among their enemies. So when you're unprepared, when you're disorganized, it puts you to shame among your enemies. And these people were unprepared in 1 Samuel 30. They were just celebrating. They thought, well, all is peace, all is safety. You know, they didn't see what was coming around the horizon. But in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, it would say, For when they shall say peace and safety... Then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. These people thought all was well, but little did they know that there would be a battle right amongst them. And we don't want to be unprepared. There's gonna, the devil is on our backs constantly trying to stop us from loving God. But in, in Ephesians 6.10, it would say, Finally, brethren, and this is through verse 18, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand it in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, 
and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So that's how we should fight our battles. In those days, they had, they, they actually fought an actual battle, but today we have the word of God, which will fight for us. And this fight lasted a good while. It said from twilight even into the next day. Fights are going to take a while. You know, when the devil comes to attack us, when things go wrong, it, it's, sometimes it's not going to be over in just a second. Sometimes it's going to take a while. But we got to realize that God will fight for us if we remain faithful. In Deuteronomy 24, it would say, For the Lord your God is he that goeth with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. So don't give up while you're fighting. Know that God will fight for you. In Galatians 6, 9, it would say, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So here in verses um, 17 through 20, they're going through a battle, and God was there fighting for them. But they had to fight, too. And that's what we have to do. We have to fight. We have to work for God. We can't just wait for things to come to us. We've got to actually reach out and get it. And God will be there for us. And remember in 1 Peter 5, 8, that the devil is a roaring lion. So we've got to fight. And we have the sword of the Spirit, as it talks about in Ephesians 6. That's what Jesus used when the devil attacked them with temptation in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. He would say, it is written. The devil would say, well, what about this? It is written. He used the word of God to defeat the devil. The sword of the Spirit is our best weapon that we have. In Hebrews 4.12, it would say, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even into the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and narrow and the discerner of, it, of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the word of God is powerful. And victory does go to the faithful. The victory is in Christ. And today we do have Christ. He will fight our battles for us if we fight for us. And then we'll get here to verses 21 through 31. This is to our main text. And we'll read from verse 21 here. And then we'll stop at verse 22 with some thoughts. And David came to the 200 men, which were so faint that they could not follow David, whom they had made also to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David, and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near to the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men, and men of Belial, and of those that went with David, and said, Because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered, save to every man his wife and his children, that they may lead them away and depart. And I guess we'll read here uh, verse 23 through 24 as well. Then David said, Dave, or, Then said David, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us, and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. Now we, in verse 22, these men are described as wicked. These men of Belial. You read in 1 Kings 21, these are the men that killed Naboth over the vineyard. You know, these men of Belial were always described as wicked. I don't know what they were doing with David, but they, they, didn't, they didn't want to share the spoils. And, you know, they didn't really think of probably of why these men were weary. Throughout the book of Samuel, throughout the book of Kings, throughout the book of Chronicles, there was a lot of fighting being done. And I'd say these men were probably pretty tired from fighting. That's probably why they had to abide by the stuff. And David said, you guys stay here. Uh, we're we're going to go fight. David didn't say, well... You guys are just wimps, you know. He, he, he let them still work, but they were tired. And, you know, these guys judge by the appearance. They didn't judge righteous judgment, as it talks about in John 7, 24. You know, they just it said, to, it said that they, it said, because they went not with us, we will not give them aught of the spoil. You know, you read of Paul's contention with Mark in Acts 15, where Paul didn't want Mark to go with them because he didn't go to the work with them. He departed uh, to Jerusalem. Um, and that would be in Acts 13 where Paul would do that. And then in Acts 15, Paul didn't want them to go with him because he didn't go to the work with them. You know, I, I think that was a, a, a bad attitude for Paul, to, by Paul. But they did reconcile to each other later on. 
So we see an attitude like this here with these men of Belial. Because they didn't do this thing with us, we're not going to share our spoils with them. You know, we may see someone not come to church for a couple weeks, and we may not know why. They may be sick. They may be uh, having family struggles. They may be going through something really tense that they are not able to come to church. And we don't want to just not invite them to fellowship or something because, well, they haven't been to church in a couple weeks. Do you know why they didn't come to church? You know, it could be for a legitimate reason. But we need to realize that, you know, there's going to be times when we can't make it to church, when we can't do certain things. We might be too busy doing something else for God. You know, you never know. And these men, they just didn't want to share with them the spoils because um, they didn't go to the work with them. And that's, that's not the attitude that we should have, you know. These wicked men, they were selfish. They were worried about what others were doing. And they were not humble. In Romans 12, 1 through 10, it would talk about many different works in the body of Christ, whether it be prophecy, ministering, exhortation, uh, teaching. But we're all members of God. We're all servants of God. And nobody is better than anybody. These men probably thought they were better than the men that didn't go with them to the battle. But that's not the right attitude that we should have. We've got to humble ourselves. And we've got to realize that we're all servants. In Matthew 20, 25 through 28, it would say, But Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise, uh, exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whatsoever will be chief among you, or whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So we got to realize that we're all servants to God. No one is better than anybody. And these men here were worried about what others were doing. They were worried about these men not going to the battle with them. They weren't thinking about themselves as they should. In Philippians 2, 12 through 15, it would say, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have, also, have always obeyed, and not as in my presence only, but now how much more in my absence? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to do to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. These men weren't lights to that day. They were worried about what, what others were doing, and they weren't focusing on what they were doing. And what they were doing was being selfish. And then you get to David. He said, Ye shall not do so, my brethren, with that which the Lord hath given us, who hath preserved us, and delivered the company that came against us into our hand. And in verse 24, For who will hearken unto you in this matter? But as his part is that goeth down to the battle, so shall his part be that tarrieth by the stuff. They shall part alike. And in verse 25, And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel unto this day. So David, he didn't have the attitude these men have. He wanted to share. He knew that it wasn't about the abundance of riches. He knew that it wasn't about coveting after other people's things. In Luke 12, verses 13 through 21, a man comes to Jesus and said, Hey, my, my brother's not sharing my inheritance with me. He's not giving me all this stuff. And Jesus says, Man, he'll make me a judge over that. You know, I'm not here to, to worry about stuff like that. He said it's not about the abundance of what you have. And he tells him a parable and he said, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. That's what David could have done here. He could have said, Look at all this spoil I got. I'm going to take this, I'm just going to gather it up, and I'm just going to have myself a party. But he didn't do that. You know, God says to this man who does this, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself, and is not rich toward God. And Jesus also would say in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. 
For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. David's heart was in God. It was in heaven. It wasn't on the riches. It wasn't on all the things that he had. He could have had that attitude, but he didn't have that attitude. He wanted to share it with people. Unlike the men of Belial. You think about the poor widow in Mark 12. She gave all her living to the church. She was thinking about what God needed, what the church needed. She wasn't thinking about herself as much as what these people needed. And we also read that Jesus came to divide spoils. And you know, I, I, don't want, to, I want to notice here in um, verse 26 through 31, at the end of uh, 1 Samuel 30, that David sent it out to Bethel, to Ramoth, to Jatir, a rower, Sifmoth, Eshtemoa, Rakal, the Jeromelites, to them which were the cities of the Kenites, to Horma, to Karashan, to Athak, to Hebron. So a lot of these places weren't Jewish places. These, some of these places were Gentile lands. He, he wanted to share it with the world. He wanted to share these spoils with everyone to say, hey, this is, this is from the spoils of the Lord. Here's a present. You know, David had a sharing attitude. You know, Jesus, he came to divide spoils with us. In Luke 11, 21 through 22, when Jesus is casting out demons, and he would say, When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted, and divideth his spoils. And Jesus came and he shared the, shared the gospel with us. He shared us the good news. He took power away from the devil, and he gave that power to us. That power is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus did exactly what David did. He fought, he fought sin and he won. And our spoils to share, what are our spoils to share today? You know, in this situation, we don't fight battles quite like they did in the Old Testament. If we did, that would, something would be wrong. But, um, but the spoils that we can share today are things like our time. We can share our money. We can share our homes. We can share our cars even. You know, someone needs a ride to church. You have a car that's able to drive, you can take them to church. You know, even if you don't have money, even if you don't have a car, even if you don't have a nice house to have people over, your time is valuable to people. Um, sending a text to someone goes a long way. I've received texts before going through a situation, and man, that text has meant everything to me, or it meant a lot to me. So, you know, we have plenty of things to share today. And, you know, are we feeding the hungry? Are we clothing the naked? Are we visiting ones in prison, inviting the poor to our homes? In Matthew 25, 31 through 46, Jesus talks about that. You know, did you do all these things? Did you have pure religion? Because pure religion and undefiled before, for God, before God is visiting or taking care of the widows and visiting the fatherless. And Jesus says, you know, if you're not doing it to these people, if you're not sharing your time, you're, you're not visiting people in prison, feeding the hungry, giving drink to the thirsty, you're not doing it to me. And our greatest pull to share would be the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, when uh, Peter and John are walking to the temple in Acts 3, they didn't have money, they didn't have gold. The man's asking for gold, and he says, give me gold. And they said, well, you know, we don't have gold, we don't have any silver, but in the name of Jesus arise, and they lifted the man up and healed him. He rose and walked. They had what they had, and they gave it to him. We can't do things like that today, but we do have the gospel. The gospel is a power unto salvation. In Mark 16, 15 through 16, he said, And Jesus said unto them before his ascension, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And there are no excuses sometimes. You know, we'll use excuses like, well, I, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. You know, I, I don't want to share the gospel. You know, even Jesus at one point thought that sharing the gospel was more important than eating. In John 4, 31 through 35, it would say, In the meantime, while his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. And he said, Therefore the disciples said one to another, Hath any man brought him anything to eat? And Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of God, the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And in Luke 9, there were people that were worried about uh, funerals. They were worried about going here or going there. Not that those things are wrong, 
But they were distracted by these things. And Jesus says the gospel of Christ is the most important thing that we have. That is our greatest spool to share. And if you've not obeyed the gospel, if you're here tonight or you're here today and you've not obeyed the gospel, I would encourage you to do so. It would be by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17, believing in the word of God, John 8, 24, repenting of past sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5, confessing Jesus Christ as your Savior, 1 John 4, 2 and verse 15, being baptized, washing away your sins, walking in the Spirit, um, Mark 16, 16, and remain faithful to him. Don't give up. Like David and his men, they did not give up on God, and they received the things that they were promised. That would be Re Revelation 2.10. Thank you.